dear friends, dear Foro Romanum, but mm -hmm. most of all, dear guests, and I hope our visitor who is going to be with us very often in the future. We have a good reason to say that we have a friend here because we know each other for many decades, but we didn't have enough opportunity to be together. And I personally do appreciate as well as Milana that we finally have our dear friends, professor whose name is so well known that the professor from, from Hanover, who was two days ago with us in Belgrade, told me, yes, of course I know him, I quoted his book. And then <coughs> Tan Balinga came and he said to me, well, I didn't expect that I will meet him for the first time in Belgrade. <laughs> Belgrade seems to be the center of the European legal history. That was the ending remark of Professor Mega. Thank you so much for coming, but we have a special reason to be happy to have such a great guest, because he is coming from a great culture of uh, Netherlands, of uh, Roman law and legal historians from this country, who are really closely connected to our faculty of law, and particularly to Forum Romano. Mm -hmm. Professor Hans Ankum, who is a legend of the country and the legend of the Roman law in Europe and in the world, is in a sense a father, uh, let's say an academic father of many scholars dealing with legal history and Roman law in Poland. And this is why we can also say that we are cousins, as Hans Ankung is also a father of Forum Romanum in Belgrade. In that sense, we are so happy that the new, new generation, let's say, of sons or grandsons of Hans Sankum are continuing the connections between the universities in Netherlands and, of course, the University of Belgrade. We are flattered to have you here, but before I give you a floor to you, I will ask Milena, as she is mostly responsible for bringing our friend here and really to have this great occasion to listen to the lecture, which is very interesting for the Serbian legal history due to the fact that Serbian civil code 1844 is in time at least, but also maybe in a manner of drafting in a sense similar to the Dutch civil code. Perfect. Thank you. which would be uh, interesting for students, I think. Um, Tamo Valga is professor of normal legal history and um, uh, uh, history of private law. He first started to teach Roman law in Amsterdam. But he was, uh, at that time, he was not a lawyer, so he didn't uh, uh, have still a uh, degree. Uh, from law school, he was a classical theologist. So he studied Latin and Greek. You will ask me probably how is it possible uh, that somebody te already teaches uh, Roman law without being a lawyer. And my answer is um, uh, I have to go back to Bologna. I uh, remember Los Atos and the uh, first uh, university, and the first was Lenerius, who was in fact a philologist, and he was not a lawyer. So this is a long tradition, <laughs> yes, uh, also with the, we can explain how he 
I was able to because uh, as a Emerius was integrated to the Corpus Juris Civilis, and uh, then later on, this was this for legal terms as you know. Um, what uh, I would like to say that he has a um, very different interests from Romolo to modern pop, but uh, his main, um, uh, if I could say, he's a specialist in medieval, uh, medieval law, and in the early reception of Roman law, uh, so it is a period of gloss ages, and um, as uh, he obtained a fellowship uh, from the uh, Royal Dutch Academy of Sciences and Arts to prepare uh, uh, to, to prepare um, one manuscript from 12th century written by, by one of the famous glossators, Wilhelmus de Cabriano. You didn't know him probably, you don't know him probably, but he is a, a pupil of Bulgarus, one of four doctors. Um, uh, this, was, uh, this book uh, was called, uh, is called uh, Casus Policis, uh, which is in fact um, a commentary of, uh, of Codex, uh, of Corpus Juris. Uh, civilis. Is it? Uh, I have told uh, everything. All right. So um, now I will give uh, my words. Uh, also, strangely enough, uh, uh, is here for the first time. All, although we know each other for such a long time, and I hope it is not the last one. Uh, I. Don't be sorry. <laughs> it won't be. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I'm very glad, and I give you uh, the word. Uh, I think this will be very interesting for all of us. Well, thank you very much, Shiva and Milena, for this uh, introduction. It really is an honor and a privilege to be able to speak to you in the context of uh, the Eastern uh, variant of Forum Romanum. There has been one in Amsterdam since the beginning of the 1960s. And Hans Ankom became professor, I think he founded Forum Romanum there, I think 1963, or maybe a little bit later. And uh, I've known for a long time that uh, there is brother of Forum Romanum uh, existed in Belgrade and it really is a privilege to uh, be able to speak to, uh, here today for such a large and distinguished audience. I was uh, two weeks, uh, two and a half weeks ago I was at Forum Romanum in Amsterdam and there were quite so many people and they only meet about once a month and I'm told that you do so every week so I'm really impressed with the, uh, the amount of people who are here. I think I'm probably slightly in front of the PowerPoint, so if you don't mind, I, uh, I will sit down and uh, now I almost disappear behind the computer, I think, but uh, there is a, a paper with texts. Those who don't have it don't need to worry because all the text will appear on the PowerPoint as well. So it's just a little premium for the ones who arrived earlier. <laughs> But uh, I think I'll start with uh, just a little bit of Dutch history. Um, because I, I realized uh, as I was coming here that I never learned anything at school about the, the history of, let's say, the middle of Europe or the more eastern parts of Europe. History was very much focused on the western part and looking towards the west to England and the United States. And I've slowly, over the years, especially in the context of these uh, international congresses on Roman law, meeting colleagues from the East, I've, I've started to learn a little bit more about your history as well. And of course, I've been here two days now. If we go on like this in three more days, I will be an expert on Serbian history because everybody is telling me just about everything. So that is, uh, that's very refreshing and uh, I can promise you this will not be the last time I come to Belgrade because so far it has been a wonderful experience and I don't see that changing over the next few days. So <laughs> this, is, uh, this is really good. Well, codification, the Netherlands, a little bit of history, the Netherlands and Holland. 
But it's also when we play football, and I'm afraid we're not taking part this summer in the big tournament. We're not as good as we used to be, at least not for the moment. But we, when we're playing football, we usually, usually say Holland. But Holland is not exactly the same as the Netherlands, although we use the term for the entire country. The Netherlands, in the broad sense of the word, and I'm glad this, I hope this is uh, reasonably visible, includes, in the light sense of the word, also Belgium, because the border Netherlands, as in Holland, comes down to about here, and this is modern Belgium. But there are 17 provinces originally which form the Netherlands in the broadest sense of the word, and seven of them are uh, the, the root of what is now the Kingdom of the Netherlands, at least in Europe, because we have a little bit in the West Indies as well. But that's uh, sort of colonial remains. Uh, this is the Netherlands, uh, about 1300, and they are separate areas who govern themselves and uh, belong under some counts and the Dukes of Burgundy. And eventually, in the, uh, in the 16th century, they all end up in the hands of uh, Charles V of Habsburg, and uh, are then treated as a kind of administrative unit, although the inhabitants of all the different provinces probably uh, consider themselves all the time just as Hollanders and Friesen, Groningers. Uh, yeah. This is... Let's see. I need to move to the next slide. This is more the Netherlands in the modern sense of the word, still without the little tail of the province of Limburg. But that is Groningen, Friesland, an area that was not a, an independent province, uh, Overijssel, Gelderland, Utrecht. And this now are two provinces, the north of Holland, Noord-Holland, and the south of Holland, Zuid-Holland, which then form the area of Holland where all the important cities are, Amsterdam, the Hague, which was basically the capital of these, uh, these countries for a long time. Rotterdam, which then was not so important. And then you have Zeeland. And here we have later added a lot of land by building dikes around it and pumping the water out as we do. And there's a saying, uh, God created the world and the Dutch created Holland. <laughs> and that's not entirely untrue, but... Uh, I don't want to take away too much credit from God either. Um, these provinces, the northern ones, the seven that I uh, just... Uh, well, I was going on about the difference between the Netherlands and Holland. The Netherlands is, uh, is the entire country, but Holland being the most important province, even then, uh, tends to uh, give its name to, uh, to the whole on occasion. So, if you want to be hyper-correct, you say the Netherlands and uh, well, Holland for short, uh, we understand you. And we do it ourselves as well. Good. Um, these provinces, uh, then, um, let's, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about Roman law before going on about history. In the, uh, the days before modern times, in the Middle Ages, uh, Roman law came to this, uh, this area by means of uh, lawyers who had studied somewhere in the university. And uh, also legal practice, notaries, public, and the church, of course, would uh, propagate some law and partly use Roman law. In the Middle Ages, you find, uh, I will mention one lawyer uh, by name, uh, Philip of Leiden, in the 14th century. He wrote a book on basically on government and administration, uh, the, the care for the republic, for the state, and uh, the, uh, the fate of the ruler, and uh, especially the, the way he, uh, he, he defines and, uh, and gives a foundation to authority, to government, is entirely built up on Roman law arguments. So he certainly knew his Roman law. And you find several lawyers, uh, some, some of them by name, and they would have been trained in those days uh, first at the University of Bologna, 
that of course would have been a pretty long journey, so you needed money, or sometimes uh, people were helped by the church if they were talented to, uh, to go and study abroad. Later, the uh, University of Orléans was established in France in the beginning of the 13th century. In the University of Paris, uh, the teaching of Roman law was forbidden in 1219 by the French king and the Pope. And then not long after, the University of Orléans came up. We can, uh, we can track the students from the Netherlands rather well in the University of Orléans because they still have the lists of the uh, students uh, from so many centuries back, which is uh, more of a problem in Bologna because they, those lists have not been kept and they are not very detailed. So you cannot always know where a student came from. But in Orléans, they give a lot of information. There has been a project in the 1980s and 1990s on the University of Orléans run uh, by the University of Leiden in the Netherlands and uh, Leuven and Gent in uh, Belgium. And then finally, in the southern Netherlands, so not the modern uh, Netherlands of the north, uh, at uh, Leuven or Louvain in, Fra in French, in 1425, a university was established, which is uh, now the oldest one in Belgium. And uh, from that point on, uh, students from the Netherlands could stu study nearer to their homes. That more or less takes care of the Middle Ages. And um, coming to modern times, uh, from the 16th century onwards, uh, lawyers under uh, Charles V and his son Philip II of Spain, who then became our king in the 1550s, um, lots of lawyers would apply Roman law in practice. Um, there would be some statu statute law, local law, uh, there would be a lot of custom, and then there would be Roman law. And uh, customary law, uh, was always a point of proof. Custom had to be proven. Uh, the written law was known to the judge. And proving custom is not all that simple. So in many cases, the judges would apply the Roman law they had learned in university in, uh, in practical cases, because if, uh, if nobody uh, based his case on customary law, or if the custom that he alleged could not be proven, and Roman law would take the place of, uh, of any failing uh, legislation and rules that, uh, that there might be in the case. Now, uh, so in this period, uh, Roman law really comes through, and you see already uh, a little bit of a rebel character in the northern Netherlands in, uh, in that uh, from, 15, from the 1540s onwards, uh, Charles V tried to get at all the law that there was in the provinces. The provinces were invited to send their law in a written form to the, the emperor's court to have it inspected and approved. And uh, in, in present-day Belgium, most of the province, provinces just did that. And in the north, we didn't. We suspected that uh, the emperor might change the law and uh, impose some law on us that, uh, that wasn't really ours, so uh, we were very reluctant to do so. And then finally, under his son, Philip II, who sent some people to the Netherlands to, uh, to rule in his place, the Duke of Alva especially, who didn't sit very well with the population. Eventually, we, uh, there already existed a war situation with uh, the Spanish official rulers from 1568 onwards. And then finally, in 1581, we sent a letter to Philip II saying, Your Majesty, we don't know what we will do without you, but we are going to try. So then uh, we officially abolished Philip II, and uh, for, for eight years uh, we went around looking for another sovereign until we discovered the idea that we didn't really need a sovereign for all the provinces, that every province had its own sovereignty, and uh, we could work together that way. And the representatives of the provinces would meet in The Hague. The Hague is effectively still the capital of the Netherlands in the political sense of the word. Although Amsterdam, since the times of Napoleon, has the name of being the capital 
Amsterdam is a beautiful city, but serious business we do somewhere else. So you're welcome to visit, but if you want to see the government, go to The Hague. And it's been like that since the 16th century. A couple of famous lawyers I have to mention. I got a little bit worried when I saw the poster that was going to announce my lecture here because uh, two of the most eminent uh, lawyers that we've had in the Netherlands over the centuries are on it. And then my name is on it as well. Thankfully, there's not a picture of me on it because I'm, I'm in illustrious company there and that uh, made me a little bit nervous, but uh, I hope I'll do all right. The first one. Uh, from this uh, newer period, and uh, born in 1583, Hugo de Zotri, the boy of wonder who uh, wrote poems in Latin when he was five years old, a real genius. And he is responsible for two uh, really important works. The first, De Jure Velia Partis, uh, about the law of war and peace, has, come, has become a standard work in, uh, in both natural law and, uh, and international law international public law, because it's, it's, uh, he really tries to establish, and I think he succeeds, uh, establishing a, a legal system and, uh, of, of general principles built up on about five general principles. Uh, respect for, uh, for ownership, giving back things that, uh, that are in your possession but belong to someone else, keeping your promises on the basis for a general law of contract, uh, repairing the damage you have done through your mistake, uh, law of torts or negations in general, and then the, uh, the fifth maxim he uses is the basis for uh, for penal law. And then also, this is in the, the Polygomena, in the, in the introduction to the Eurobelia Parkis, he also establishes uh, a secular natural law because he says if uh, if if we were to say if we were to say, he's, he's being very, very careful, if we were to say that God does not exist or doesn't care about mankind, that would, be still, that would still be natural law. So he establishes a natural law that doesn't find its basis in religion as it, as it did before, for, in, for instance, in moral theology or in canon law. But he uh, establishes uh, principles of uh, natural law, rational natural law, and, and basically the idea is that you just sit down in your study as a learned lawyer and uh, develop your own legal system on, uh, on some basic uh, principles, on axiomata, to say it in uh, mathematical terms. And this book has been, uh, been a classic of uh, international law ever since. And the inleiding, the introduction, uh, Dutch word meaning introduction, it was really written for his son, and it, uh, it's the inleiding to the Hollandse rechtsgeleerdheid, uh, the introduction to the, uh, the jurisprudence, to the learned law of Holland, the province of Holland. He started his career as a city lawyer in Rotterdam and then went into national politics, or national uh, in, uh, in quotation marks, because uh, it was still uh, a federal state of seven provinces and not one country. The inleiding uh, is a systematic representation based on the, the system of, of the Instituciones of uh, Justinian, basically. Three books, he leaves out procedural law because that had been done very well by someone else. And he said there's no point in doing that again. Uh, the law of persons, of, of things, uh, inheritances and uh, obligations, he treats in three books. Uh, more or less along the same uh, system as in the the Institutionis of Justinian. This is a time when Roman law starts coming under some criticism. And natural law becomes a kind of competition for Roman law. And then there is a not so very famous lawyer, but he does something very typical for his time, Simon van Groenewegen, who writes a book about the De Legibus Abrogatis, about the, the abolished laws. And that is uh, basically about uh, one big question, how much Roman law is still applicable law in the Netherlands? And he doesn't just do it for Holland, but he treats mainly, but he treats the other provinces as well. So it's a representation of how much 
Roman law is still applicable law. It's still quite a lot at the time, but it's not necessarily the entire corpus juris anymore. And then Van Dijkershoek, Binkershoek, as some uh, say, we have very few sound recordings left from the 18th century, so we don't really know. The observation is to Boutoirier. He was a practical lawyer. He, uh, he was never a professor in university, neither was he a dog, by the way. And uh, Bankershoek was uh, first a judge on the Supreme Court of the provinces of Holland and Zeeland, who shared uh, a superior court that the other provinces didn't have. And um, in those days, courts in general would just give their decision without motivation. They would just tell you, this is it, and you try and live with it. Bankershoek noted down the discussions that went on in chambers. And this was uh, these notes that he made in haste, observationis tumultuarie, quickly written down as he was uh, talking with his colleagues about the cases. Uh, later came to light in the beginning of the 20th century. They were lost for a long time and uh, discovered by a professor I'll also mention later on, Myers, uh, in, an, uh, in an antiquariat and then published. Very interesting stuff that uh, shows you the a lot of Roman law arguments that went on in, uh, in chambers in, uh, in the court of uh, the High Court of Zealand and uh, in Holland. And for instance, if you uh, refer to the parties in the case, he always calls them, as you will find in text in the Corpus Juris, Sempronius on one side and Titius on the other side. So this is uh, an interesting book, uh, insight into the workings of the of the Supreme Court of two provinces in, uh, in the late 17th and uh, beginning of the 18th century. Universities in those days, uh, the first university in the Northern Netherlands, in these uh, rebellious countries, uh, was founded in Leiden. Still the, the broadest university in the Netherlands in the sense that you can study more different subjects there than in any other university. It's the most traditional one. And it was a kind of, uh, kind of premium, kind of prize for the city of Leiden, which had uh, withstood the siege by the Duke of Alva, the representative of the Spanish king, for several years. And then when the city was liberated in uh, 1573, on the 3rd of October, they still celebrate that. Um, so that's a holiday in Leiden and nowhere else in the Netherlands. Two years later, a university was founded there. And then slowly, other provinces started the universities. Franeker in Friesland, in the north. In the north, they were free. Uh, Groningen uh, then came uh, as third, some time later. Franeker is a tragical case because it was uh, abolished by Napoleon in the early 19th century, when we were under French rule. And the curious detail about uh, the buildings of the University of Franeker is that uh, part of them were used at the time to start a lunatic asylum. And some people say that uh, it's a kind of hospital for the mentally insane. And uh, some people say that uh, the people at Franeker didn't, didn't notice all that much difference. So universities uh, started coming up in the Northern Netherlands and um, eventually in the, around the middle of the, the 17th century, Utrecht had been founded in Amsterdam, came very late with the universities, Utrecht in uh, 1638, and there was uh, another university at Gelderland, one of the uh, provinces uh, that was also abolished under Napoleon because they had they had gotten the name that you could buy any diploma that you wanted there, just in exchange for money. You didn't have to go to, uh, to listen to the professor's lectures. You just paid and you got a wonderful diploma from the University of Heidelberg. So the podium did away with them, and I think that's, uh, that's only for the better. What came up is in the 17th century is the, the Dutch uh, variation, the Dutch version of uh, legal humanism which was very strong in France in the middle of the 16th century with people like uh, Boudet and, uh, and Pujat and uh, Donellus. 
Donelis was at Leiden for some time. He uh, was a Protestant who had to flee from France and from 1579 to 1586 he was professor at Leiden. A bit of a controversial man because as a Protestant he, uh, he got involved in all sorts of theological debates and that didn't do his uh, position as a professor any good. But uh, then, then in the, starting in the middle of the 17th century, uh, the, the Dutch uh, lawyers became famous for their version of legal humanism and uh, I speak of the Dutch elegant school. I wouldn't say that elegance is uh, something that you now necessarily uh, associate with Dutch and even less maybe with their lawyers, but in those days uh, there were elegant lawyers who wrote excellent Latin and uh, uh, combined uh, legal studies with studies of the classics as a whole. And maybe in that sense I'm uh, a little bit of an elegant lawyer in, uh, in the modern sense of the word, but I'm becoming too arrogant, I think, as I say that. And then slowly, in the 18th century, uh, we start developing towards codification. Uh, what were seven provinces working together for defense, for foreign politics, but for the, all the rest, they had their own policies. In the 18th century, a movement started coming up of people who were in favor of unification and who thought that we would do better as a united country than as seven provinces more or less doing their own thing most of the time. And those Unitarians uh, eventually uh, won. Uh, they, they got into power uh, with the help of the French after the French Revolution in 1795. And the first constitution for the entire country as a, as a single state, a combination of all these seven provinces, was drawn up in 1798. And it, there was one extremely optimistic article in it that said that uh, codifications, that law books have to be made for private law, for penal law, and for procedural law. And the commission was started of uh, uh, 12, 12 lawyers, and they had to make these books in two years. There was a great deal of optimism at the time. Commission of 12. Subcommission uh, of seven of these 12 were involved in uh, trying to make a civil code. And if you see the kind of letters they exchanged, they, they weren't doing uh, what you should do when you're in such a project, project is say, every single day we make 10 new articles, no matter what. What they did was start a sort of discussion of, of broad principles of law, and of course they were getting nowhere taking that approach. Plus was uh, the, I can't remember if he was the, the president of the entire committee, but he was certainly in charge of the civil code. Yes, Gus was a professor at, um, there was not yet a university of Amsterdam, it was an Ateneum Illustri, so they, they didn't have academic promotions, but it was higher education, and he was the only professor there for Roman law and natural law. And he was on this, uh, this committee, and he certainly was in charge of the subcommittee for, uh, for private law. And uh, if I mention these letters on broader principles, uh, I, I'm thinking of texts of his, a large text on very small points. And uh, you could see that that was not going to achieve uh, codification in two years. Johannes van der Linden uh, was a, a lawyer in Amsterdam, a very practical man who had written a, a manual on, uh, on civil law and commercial law in 1806. And in that same year, 1806, uh, something very significant happened. Uh, we had been a republic ever since uh, taking our leave of the Spanish king. And in 1798, we also established a republic, the Batavian Republic. In the Batavi were uh, one of those peoples that the Romans met uh, in the times of Julius Caesar when they came north. And so that was a sort of nostalgic thing when the, this, uh, this single republic was uh, established. Um, in 1806, a brother of Napoleon became our first king. First king of the, the kingdom of was then called the Kingdom of Holland. Again, Holland as short for the entire country. 
not just the two modern provinces. And we were lucky with him because uh, Napoleon established his other brother, uh, Joseph, in Spain and Italy. And Joseph had uh, made a name for himself in Spain. He is called Pepe Botella, which means uh, Joseph the Bottle, which referred to his famous, uh, his, his main hobby. Apparently, the Spanish make good wine, you have to say, but uh, he was not as useful as a king of his countries as uh, his brother Louis, who, uh, Lodewijk, who came to the Netherlands. So we, and Napoleon, after a short while, became very sorry for having appointed this brother of his as uh, king of the Netherlands, because he really wanted to be king of the Netherlands and not so much the representative of his big brother. So he really, he tried to learn our language. He was not very successful. And he, uh, he tried to say, uh, I am the king of Holland, uh, koning von Holland. But he didn't say koning, he said konijn, which means rabbit. So that wasn't a great success, but he tried. And he made himself pretty popular. Eventually, uh, and he tried to make uh, an, uh, the own codification of private law and other parts of law for the Netherlands. Uh, and of course, Napoleon insisted on introducing his, uh, his law books, uh, the Code Civil for private law and the other ones that they had made. But uh, for the Louis said, no, no, this is different people and uh, different customs and the country is not quite the same, so they need a separate law book. And Napoleon said, well, there's not even two million people there. We now have 17 million, it's got a bit, gotten a bit crowded. But still, his brother insisted, and he made eventually, and his, uh, he gave the, I'm going too fast, he gave uh, Van der Linden the assignment to make uh, a civil code. And Van der Linden, having uh, his man manual as preparation, made a civil code on his own in one year. And you don't want a commission doing that, you want one man doing that. It's easier to make decisions. But Politically speaking, this was unacceptable to Napoleon, so eventually they uh, introduced in 1809 uh, the first uh, civil code for the Kingdom of the Netherlands in the, in the Northern Netherlands, these seven provinces. Uh, it's called the Code of Napoleon, the, the Code Civil was called Code Napoleon from 1807 onwards, and it looks by the title that this is an adaptation of the Code Civil. I've studied Van der Linden's work on, uh, on torts and negligence, and I have the impression that this is really a politically acceptable title for what is rather an adaptation of Van der Linden's draft to the Code Civil. And not so much an adaptation of the Code Civil. There seems to be a lot of Van der Linden there, but that's, uh, that's a project for the future to really sort out how much Van der Linden is still there in this, uh, this law book of 1809. 1809, with the introduction of this single codification for the, the whole country, is the, uh, uh, the aboli abolition also of Roman law. Roman law was officially put aside at this moment. No longer applicable law in the courts. Officially. You have to, have to quote the code, but uh, of course the way of thinking of the, the lawyers were still very much determined by that Roman law training and Roman law training did not stop in the universities after 1809. Different from France and Belgium where the, the uh, universities were also adapted to the new uh, law books and uh, they were the only material that could be taught. Um, Yes, and then, uh, so from 1809, we had for a short time this uh, particular codification, but Napoleon got fed up with his brother, put him under so much political pressure that he uh, abdicated in 1810. And then from 1810 onwards, we were in incorporated uh, in France. And in 1811, the Code Napoleon was introduced as codification in the, the Northern Netherlands. Very particular system in the Code Civil. Uh, the first book is on the uh, law of persons. The second one is on goods and the different forms of ownership. And the Code Civil very much focuses on ownership because ownership, especially the uh, land ownership, was very uncertain under the French Ancien Regime. 
and uh, the Code Civil made a point of uh, turning ownership into what it's uh, called the droit inviolable et sacré, an uh, unalienable and sacred right. And you see that uh, the entire book three, officially by way of its title, is uh, then dedicated to how you acquire ownership. And you would ask, uh, where is the law of obligations? Well, it is in book three. It more or less comes in on the back of the, the contract of sale, which of course in French law is a way of acquiring ownership. Because in, uh, in French law, when you make a contract of sale, the contract of sale does not just create obligations to deliver and pay, but it also transfers ownership at the same time. That's a different system from the Roman law system where proper ownership only transferred with delivery. And I'll have something to say about that later on as well. So after the contract of sale, you find a lot of contracts in the Code Civil which are not about acquiring ownership at all, um, but it's just uh, the structure of the, the Code Civil that, uh, and the name of the books that uh, is, is remarkable in this sense. And that applied until 1838 in the, the Northern Netherlands. Of course, we didn't uh, have Napoleon for much longer, until 1813, and then his rule was effectively ended in, uh, in the Netherlands. He uh, was finally disposed of in 1814, and in 1815 with the Vienna uh, Conference after uh, the rule of Napoleon, uh, we were given a little present in the form of modern Belgium, uh, the southern provinces which we had been apart from since the 16th century were added to this kingdom of, uh, of Holland under uh, a forefather of our uh, present uh, king. And I have to say, many of the Belgians, more than half the Belgians, speak more or less the same language as we do in the, the Northern Netherlands, but it was not a happy company. We tried to make a new legislation, new code civil, new civil code for this whole new kingdom, and in the south they said, why? We have the Code Civil, and whatever you think of the French, this is a pretty good law book. So why change it? But in the North, we insisted. One of the arguments was, no, we want the good old-fashioned Roman law system that we've always had of transfer ownership by delivery. We don't want this newfangled French stuff of doing it in the contract itself. And slowly, slowly, with lots of criticism on the first drafts, uh, which were under a pupil of Brass uh, Kemper, uh, slowly we developed a, a common uh, civil code for this new kingdom of the 17 old uh, Netherlands provinces. But then, in 1830, there was an opera, La Muette de Potici, in, uh, being shown in Brussels, and there is a scene in that opera where people get up and uh, shout freedom and liberation and uh, that continued after the opera in the streets of Brussels and the southern Netherlands started their own country. Sometimes happens. It was finally settled in 1839. So then we were on our own in the north with this compromise code, we, which we then revised a little bit, and eventually in 1838 we made our own uh, former civil code. And that's in four books on persons, goods, obligations, and then very much in the style of both uh, the Institutes of Justinian, the fourth book mainly on procedural aspects, not the entire law of civil procedure, but some aspects. So it's, it's kind of an echo of what you find in, uh, in, in Justinian and also Gaius, who of course has been rediscovered in 1816. So that, that was also uh, the first Dutch edition of the Institutionis uh, of Gaius, I think dates back to 1820. So that's reasonably early. That, that was probably on the desk of the, the commission at some stage. Well, this is, uh, and of course, we went back to the, uh, the well-known system of uh, transferring ownership by delivery. Now, I do a little interlude, especially for Professor Abramovich, who is very much interested in, uh, in, in uh, reception of law that is really a coincidence. 
There's one article, and the French system of transfer of ownership relies on Article 1138 of the Code Civil, which says if the, 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 the obligation to deliver transfer of ownership. Article 1583 on the contract of sale says contract of sale is perfect upon the agreement of the parties about the, the good and the price, even if the good has not been delivered and the price not been paid, but ownership transfers from the seller to the buyer. But there's an essential article, of course, in Article 1599, which says the sale of someone else's good is invalid in French law, which of course you have to do, because if the contract itself transfers ownership at the same time, you cannot have a valid contract of sale about a good that does not belong to the seller. Otherwise, as a seller, you would be able to transfer ownership of a good that's not yours, and that militates against the good old Roman rule of Nemo plus in uh, Digest 50-17, and I forget which one exactly, 134 or something. Well, this Article 1599, of course, is not needed in a system like the Dutch system, which transfers ownership through delivery. And we can perfectly have a contract of sale, a valid contract of sale, where the object of the sale does not belong to the seller. It just, the contract of sale cause, uh, causes, uh, creates obligations. And the seller will have a problem to deliver the thing and make the buyer owner. But he makes his own problem, and he's welcome to make his own problem, and he has time until delivery to acquire the ownership in the good, and then well, there will be no problem in the end. So we don't need Article 1599 of the French Code Civil. However, if you follow the articles, the, the Peace on Obligations in Book 3 of the Old Dutch Civil Code, has the same articles, uh, lots of the law of obligations is copied from the, the French Code Civil. And you find the previous articles, and then you find in article, article 1507, a literal translation of Article 1599 of the Code Civil, which has no business being there in a codification which has a different system of transfer of ownership. I think it was just accidentally translated on a Monday morning when they hadn't had coffee yet. Something like that. It was just translated without thinking about the system. So that's a curious detail that uh, should never have been there. But once it was in the codification, lawyers had to interpret it. And there was, was a big discussion. Many articles were written about the exact function. And the exact function is it should ne never have been there. But it, it was there. It didn't cause any harm either. But uh, it's a nice detail of uh, when you take over foreign legislation, you have to be very careful. I have another story as well, but I... I won't do that right now because uh, I don't want to be too long. 1938, 100 years of Burgerlijk Wetboek, Civil Code. It was a big book done in memory with articles by all sorts of lawyers from the Netherlands on aspects of law. And there were two articles concerned with the question after 100 years, and there had been some changes made. There had even been an attempt in the 1880s and 1890s to do a new, new version of the civil code, to adapt it a little bit, because uh, the Germans, with their Kandektenwissenschaft, were, were putting uh, legal science on a higher level, especially of precision of concepts and definitions and uh, also uh, a different system. And uh, there were many lawyers and, uh, in the second half of the 19th century in the Netherlands interested in that, and they thought that it could uh, improve the Dutch legislation if they made a new civil code along, more along German lines. But that pro project never came to be. In 1938... Yes, there's, I don't think there's a lot in other languages about that. So... Um, no, probably very, very little. Maybe a little bit in German here and there. Two main articles on the question, what do we do with our civil law, with our uh, civil code after 100 years? And there's, uh, the first article is by a professor from uh, Amsterdam, very good uh, on, on legal principles and, uh, and, and basic ideas about law, Paul Scholten. 
who wrote an article saying, well, our civil code is, is, is like an old house. We like living in it. Okay, it leaks here and there. We had the roof repaired. The wind is coming in in some places, but it, we're comfortable with it. It's our old house, don't change it. We don't want to live anywhere else. And then there was Meyers, who was from Leiden. I mentioned him uh, in the earlier as well. He did some very good work on the, the school of, uh, on the University of Orléans. He rediscovered the Observationes Promotuare of, uh, of Bankershoek. So he was, uh, he basically, he was a professor for civil law, but he was a great legal historian as well. And uh, he wrote an article saying, well, there are so many things wrong, and he gave a long list of things that, had, uh, that were wrong with the civil code in his opinion, and we really need a new one. And he started his draft for the new civil code in, in remarkable circumstances, because he was Jewish, and he uh, was taken by the German uh, occupants uh, in the Netherlands uh, to a concentration camp, not an extermination camp, the Regenstadt, where they kept the Jewish intellectuals. And the Germans felt, uh, well, maybe they might come in handy someday, apparently. And even in Theresienstadt, he started on his draft for a new Dutch civil code with the, the very limited means he had at his uh, disposal. And it's remarkable under the circumstances that he, uh, he started incorporating some of the, of the, of the German findings, some, some of the German Wissenschaft for his uh, new uh, Dutch civil code. And in 1947, after the war, he uh, was commissioned by the government to indeed develop new civil code for the Netherlands, and he was uh, he was had a good part of it finished in 1954 when he suddenly died, and then his place was taken by a commission of three, and then of course one man makes decisions a lot easier than uh, a commission of three, and so it took uh, a while before it eventually uh, became the new civil code. And usually we say the Civil Code of 1992, but if you see where the books came in, Law of Persons and Family was already uh, redone in 1970 with a small uh, addition in 1995, but mainly it was already introduced in uh, 1970. Legal Persons in 1976, and then 1992, Book 3, The General Part of Patrimonial Law, uh, that is more or less along the German lines of the German, German BGB, which starts at the very beginning with the general part. Uh, in the Dutch uh, New Civil Code, it only starts in Book 3, but uh, there you have the more general things in the beginning. For instance, the, 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 let's say the lesser real rights like, uh, like Pignus, Hypotheca, which can also uh, apply to, uh, to non-physical uh, uh, goods are already in Book 3. Law of Succession was, of course, held up by the notaries public who didn't agree with some uh, new aspects of the, the Law of Successions, but it, uh, it took 10 more years for that to be introduced. Book 5, uh, Real Rights Ownership, and those real rights that can only apply to physical objects are in Book 5. Book 6 is the Law of Obligations, General Part. Title 3 on the Obligations uh, of Tort and Negligence. Uh, title 5 on Contracts. And Title 4 is this wonderful, uh, wonderful title on Obligation not resulting from torts or contracts. Wonderful negative de definition. What you find there is Management of Another's Affairs, Undue Payments, and uh, a new, uh, new uh, source of obligations, unjustified uh, enrichment. And then come the individual, individual contracts in uh, Book 7. And we have Book 7a, which uh, are the uh, provisions on contracts, which are still in the form of the old civil code. I think Book 7a, I didn't check, uh, is almost disappeared by now, or indeed has disappeared because more and more was transferred to titles in Book 7. Um, what this means is that you no longer find, for instance, all the rules on the contract of sale in one place. If you're dealing with the contract of sale, you have to go to Book 3 first, which is on legal acts. 
and the uh, legal acts, any act which aims at a legal effect is a legal act. It can be one-sided, it can be uh, two-sided. But there you start. In book three, you have, for instance, provisions on uh, on force and um, and then and, and, uh, and the other one, uh, abuse of circumstances. And then uh, the second part you have to see is the general part of the law of obligations, the title and contracts, the article 217. A contract is formed by an offer and the acceptance of it, any offer, any form of acceptance. So uh, basically contracts are all consensual. And then in book seven you find the first title on the law of sales. We have, you, you have to look in three different books. A Spanish colleague of mine recently asked me, um, I can't find the Dutch rules. I, I found the rules on error, which are in book six. But don't you have force? Don't you have abuse of circumstances? Uh, don't you have deceit? And I was tempted to say, no, Pedro, we don't have deceit in the Netherlands. You only have that in Spain. But I said, no, they are in book three on the, in the general provisions on legal acts. So and I have book six on traffic and transport, book nine, will not come into existence. It was planned to be on intellectual property. But then in 2012, we did make a book on private international law. So in the end, we will have uh, nine books. When book 7a has disappeared, and book nine will never be. So that is uh, the new civil code. How am I doing for time? I think I need another five minutes or so. Is that OK? Yeah. All right, I wanted to do uh, so far about the present Dutch codification, which uh, well, basically uh, is now six years old, if you count book 10 as the latest edition. And of course, Roman law, I told you, was abolished in 1809. It was abolished again in 1829 on the eve of the introduction of the civil code for the Netherlands in broad sense, including modern-day Belgium. And then in 1838, just to be sure, it was abolished for the first time. But Roman law continued to be in the university, especially in Leiden. They, they said, well, we may have a new codification of law, but we will still use our Roman law frame of mind and frame of reference to interpret it. But uh, Roman law partly disappeared, and what disappeared especially were the, uh, the provisions of Roman law that you find in the Actio Retributoria and Actio Quanti Minoris, which came up in Roman law. You probably know this and may not have to say this for everybody, but they came, uh, they came about in the context of the sale of slaves and cattle in the market. They were the first form of consumer protection in Roman law, because basically in Roman law it was uh, when you left the market you had no guarantee whatsoever. And you just had to inspect what you were buying, as in uh, what if you buy something in the market nowadays you don't get a lot of guarantee of, or consumer, consumer protection either. But in the slave and cattle market this came up and it was the, the ability to either return a good that was unsatisfactory, that uh, in case of non-conformity, as we call it nowadays, um, you could give it back with the, uh, and uh, you could enforce that in, uh, before the judge with the actual retributoria, or you could say, well, it's not as good as I thought it would be, but I'll keep it, but I want the price reduced, the actual quantum minoris. And this, uh, this became generalized, these, these Special possibilities were incorporated also in the general action on sale in Roman law, and by the time Justinian made his codification in the Corpus Juris Civilis, he could have done away with these special actions because he could have the same with the simple actio empty, the normal action for the buyer. But he didn't, he left them in, and therefore they are also in modern Dutch law. I'm just going to quote. Um, I'm giving. I'm going to give you now a little experience of Dutch. I'm going to read this article in Dutch so that you know what it sounds like. De verkoper is gehouden tot vrijwaring wegens verborgene gebreken van het verkochte goed die het zelf ongeschikt maken tot het gebruik waartoe het bestemd is, of die dat gebruik in diervoegen verminderen dat bij al die verkoper de gebreken gekend had. Hij het goed of in het geheel niet 
of niet dan voor een mindere prijs zouden gekocht hebben. There are some old words from 1838 that my present-day students might not understand there. But that's the beginning of the, the old Dutch civil code on non-conformity of goods that are sold in the market. Um, the seller is not responsible for visible defects. Um, he has to guarantee defects even if he didn't know them. And then the main article we want to deal with is the case mentioned in 1540 and 1542. The buyer has a choice to either give back the good and reclaim the selling price, the Roman actual retributoria, or keep the good and have such an amount of the selling price returned to him as the judge, after hearing experts, shall determine. So that's the actual quanti minoris. And they were in the old Dutch civil code. But Meyers did what Justinian could have done, but didn't do in the new, new civil code in the Netherlands in 1992. These two actions disappeared as separate actions that were specifically mentioned. So, a little bit of Roman law that wasn't really necessary disappeared there. And then, the revenge of Roman law. The European Union made a directive on consumer law in 1999, directive number 44, which says in Article 3 on the rights of the consumer, in the case of a lack of conformity, the consumer shall be entitled to have the goods brought into conformity free of charge by repair or replacement in accordance with paragraph 3, or to have an appropriate reduction made in the price, or the contract rescinded with regard to those goods in accordance with paragraphs 5 and 6. So this is and the price uh, reduction in price, actio quanti minoris, or the contract rescinded, actio retributoria. And because the conditions for it was possible to lower the price or rescind the contract under the 1992 civil code in the Netherlands, but it was not completely under the same circumstances as the directive prescribed. So, in function of this the directive, of course, based on the general private law of most of the European Union countries, which, of course, had Justinian's two actions still in it, uh, we have been forced to reintroduce some Roman law in uh, modern Dutch private law, In uh, eventually we adapted uh, the civil code in uh, 2002, and that was the latest bit of reception of Roman law in Dutch private law in the third millennium. That's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Of course, uh, the main explanation for that, I think, is uh, in French law, because they are different. France is different. Why, why did the French make this? Uh, yes. Um, it is, uh, much of that is to do with... Uh, part is extremely complicated in that uh, Justinian started part of the confusion by um, a Roman law had three types of delivery, the mancipatio, the iuricessio, which were formal and didn't require a title. And then you had the traditio, which is just the handing over. And then you have title, you have to have a title because you need to explain. If, you, if I give you a book, uh, the gesture as such doesn't explain whether you become owner or possessor or just uh, the tentor of, uh, of the book. So we have to look why it happens and that, uh, that will be the title or the causa. And Justinian um, did, away, did away with the Mancipatio and the Iuricessio and just left Traditio, but he used texts which had Mancipatio and Iuricessio and put that he would love to have had a computer because he could have done search and replace. 
and then uh, he would have done it very quickly. But then, therefore, in Roman law, we have uh, texts that, uh, that have a traditio with title and other texts that have traditio without the title. And there are some texts that focus on the, on the will of the owner to transfer his ownership. That mainly explains um, why the, the Dutch and the German systems, for instance, are different, uh, requiring a title, or rather this uh, German Dingliche Vertrag, which is the agreement of the parties that they want to transfer ownership, which is not the contract of sale. The French system uh, partly works with something that uh, in, existed also in Roman law, the tra traditio has different forms. It's the little, uh, literal traditio of a small object which you can hand over from hand to hand. You have the some symbolic traditio of something that you cannot hand over, like land. You walk around it or you, you go through the gate with uh, the buyer, for instance, and indicate, or you get up on a tower and indicate where exactly the land is. And then you have the Brezi Manu, where the, 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 someone rents a thing and then says to the owner, can I buy that from you? Uh, I'd like to keep it, it's very useful, and then they make an agreement, and then it's not handed over because it had been handed over before. And then the mirror image of that is the Constitutum Processorium, where someone sells something and says to the buyer, um, I don't mind selling it to you now, but I still need it for a week. Can we agree that I keep it for a week uh, as a loan or that I still rent it for a week from you? But ownership will pass, but the object will remain in the hands of the original owner. But ownership passes. And that system was used first in Italy and then in France by the notary's public to transfer the ownership of land especially. They would include a clause in the contracts saying that I declare, the owner uh, who would transfer the ownership of his land would declare in the, in the contract, in the written contract, I declare that I possess in your name. So he would transfer his position from being owner and possessor to just being detentor and exercising the, the direct power over the object, not for himself, but for someone else. And then you have a form of, uh, of transferring ownership that does not include the visible delivery of the, of the object. And uh, along those lines, uh, there's probably a little bit more to be said about uh, the transfer of, uh, of movable uh, goods, but for immovable goods, this was the French system that eventually uh, influenced the, the civil code and, uh, and made this system of, uh, of transferring ownership uh, in the contract itself already. What was the role of the Jesuits in terms of the nature of law in Southern during the 70s? About the southern Netherlands, well, that is Belgium, and I don't know very much about Belgium. The Jesuits were very important because, um, very important for law. Of course, they were uh, in the first place theologians, but uh, in Spain, in the school of Salamanca, this, uh, this is also a question of money. And in Spain, money starts flowing in when they discover America, and then there's a blossoming of legal science in Spanish. In the, in the 16th century in the school of Salamanca and there's some uh, there's money available in France in the 16th century also and uh, legal humanism starts but the Jesuits in Spain uh, sort of transfer moral theology to the, to the ter terrain of law as well and you have several words uh, de jure et justitia or de justitia jure by uh, the Domingo de Soto for instance and that was, um, that came to the north, uh, certainly in the form of, uh, there was one person uh, very important in the University of Leuven, uh, was uh, Leonard Lysius. He was a Belgian Jesuit, trained in the University of Leuven, who was in contact with uh, his, uh, his Spanish uh, Jesuit colleagues. And he also wrote a book uh, about basic principles of justice and law, also under this uh, popular title, De Justitia Dual. Sorry? 
Yes, in part, a very concrete uh, um, example you can find in the unification of contract law and the unification of the law of torts. Uh, Roman law has separate delicts. Um, in, in moral theology, you have the doctrine of restitution of uh, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, which basically says any damage you do to someone else is a sin which you have to confess and you can't get absolution until you have put it right, until you've made restitution. And that applies to any situation where you've done something wrong, you have not uh, acted out your contractual obligation or your, where you have caused damage. And this very broad principle was handed down to, or brought over to the, the, the terrain of law by the, by the uh, moral theologies of, uh, of the School of Salamanca. And that then came north uh, through Lesius, and my colleague from Leuven University, of course, said, Hugo de Groot all had it from Lesius. I don't think so. Is it, is it Wim de Kok? No, uh, his, his master, uh, Laurent Walkens, uh, always said uh, there was. But uh, we know Hugo de Groot was imprisoned uh, for two years until he escaped, famously in, in a bookcase. You can still see the castle where he was imprisoned. And there's a very, very narrow staircase leading up to the room where he was. And there's a very broad bookcase that could never have come down the stairs. So it's a, a very interesting story. Anyway, we know that Hugo de Groot had the book of Domingo de Soto, the Justitia Dior, brought to him at the castle of Rubenstein where he was imprisoned. So he had a direct look at the Spanish works as well. He, uh, he may have heard about it through Lesius, but he, uh, he certainly uh, had a direct link uh, himself also. But uh, and this, these, these general principles of, uh, of, of, let's say, still religiously inspired uh, natural law uh, came to Grotius from Spain and uh, the Jesuits certainly uh, played a part there. But of course the Northern Netherlands being Protestant uh, mainly from the middle of the 16th century, uh, the Jesuits uh, lost their direct influence there. But there was uh, the, uh, academic work ne is never interested in these religious differences. We read each other's books anyway. So that's, that's more or less the lines along which these, these more broad ideas tend to the north. May I add on something? Leven was a Catholic university and Leiden yeah. was a Protestant. Leiden so was Protestant. So this is like, uh, well, you know, uh, there is two contracts. Uh, and so, for example, uh, to go to Mel School, whom you mentioned, uh, from France and uh, went to, uh, because he was moving up and went to uh, yes. Leiden. Yes, but, but then in the end, um, it is interesting to see that, for instance, later Protestant northern uh, jurist Vinius in the, in the late 17th century, um, he wrote a very basic and, uh, and very accessible work, also along the lines of the Institute of uh, Justinian. And that was, uh, that was Protestant, of course, in the sense that it treated marriage not as, uh, as the Catholics would, it, would have it as a sacrament of the church. So that was a dangerous part. A civic contract. Sorry? A civic contract. A marriage is seen as a civic um, contract. I'm not quite sure, but it's certainly not uh, the way the Catholics would like it. And I've seen in the University of, uh, of Valladolid in Spain two copies of his uh, book on the Institutes uh, of Vinius. And there was one which was expurgated and all these uh, passages that were dangerous to read for the average Catholic had been crossed out in ink. But there was another copy that was pristine, that was not changed, that was probably kept with, uh, beneath lock and key and only uh, that could be uh, read by some uh, proven people who would not be shaken in their faith by reading that. So that uh, the Protestant works did come to Catholic uh, terrain, but uh, for the average reader, the dangerous parts would be taken out. We would like to add, uh, let's say, where we end of the session, a few parallels or the differences between the Dutch civil code and the Syrian civil code. 
course, there is a long tradition of the French influence in the Netherlands, which lasted and it was a kind of logical end to the approach to civil cult as a Roman system. But nevertheless, this, uh, let's say, different feature of the Dutch civil cult and the Syrian cult, there are many interesting similarities, and then I'm always impressed. First in timing. It is, as I like to call it, the second generation of civil cults. It comes nearly the same time, 1838 and the Serbian one in 1844. And uh, then uh, they are both strongly influenced by the foreign uh, legal system. They are all, let's say, representatives of legal transfers and legal transplants. They all know to the Western legal tradition. The Dutch one with the French tradition and the Serbian one with the Austrian. Mm -hmm. And mainly due to those influences, both cults were usually accused to be a copy mm -hmm. of the French and the Serbian of the Austrian Syria. However, I would say that little by little it is evident that it is not completely true. Mm -hmm. And my problem with the Dutch Syria cult, it was also the end of his problem, the Serbian one is that most Dutch scholars are writing in their language, mm. not in English, French, German, as well as we do in sure. <laughs> So, my question after all, do you know any book in English, German, French, which is profoundly speaking about this kind of influence, or let's say the book about Dutch single cult, the book which is not written uh, there certainly is one, which is uh, a basic introduction to Dutch law in English for, for foreign students, uh, written by, well, under the redaction now because there are uh, contributions by lots of people. But there is something, Jeroen Forlis, who used to be, uh, or was for a number of years, professor in Leiden before he went into the judiciary, uh, he took care of that. And uh, I can give you that title. Uh, so that's, that's at least an introduction, uh, but um, and I think recently there, there probably is, there's probably a little more in English, but at the time but, uh, I think there might be some literature towards the end of the 19th century about the Dutch legal system in German, but uh, then not in English, because of course English is not, uh, not a logical language to, uh, to write about these uh, legal systems. But as far as the transplants go, uh, yes, you always see that uh, a country that, that needs a qualification looks to the most recent successful qualifications that they can get at. Um, the French court civil was very important in, uh, in most countries of Latin America, which became independent from Spain in the beginning of the 19th century. And Japan is a very interesting case, because Japan was a, an island where only the Dutch were allowed in. Uh, in a small part of which is now the harbor of uh, Nagasaki, but they, you know, only an island, and not not on the, uh, the the main island of Japan. But Japan opened itself up to the world in 1868, and then wanted uh, codification as well, and they got a French professor in, um, well, Mr. Nice. de Fontarabi, de de Bassana de Fontarabi. And he was there for a long time, he made some uh, codes, and the civil code was, was almost ready in 1891. And then the, the Japanese discovered that the Germans were doing a new one. And then, uh, and, and nowadays we say uh, the, the Japanese civil code is, is German, but they have the French system of transfer of ownership. So they kept little bits. There are a few articles taken from the Spanish civil code of 1889 as well. Also a recent one they had a look at. So there's always, uh, always a mixture. The, it will never be a complete copy, but it's very logical to look at the recent uh, code. For instance, I think we managed to sell part of our new civil code to, uh, to the Russians in the early 1990s. We had a, a Congress of Roman Law in 1992 in Amsterdam, and there was uh, a lot of ma money available from the Ministry of Justice to invite people from the east of Europe because we thought we might be able to sell them our civil code. So that was, uh, and I think we succeeded to some extent. Some of us were there at that yes. time. I remember uh, that at that time one very uh, 
Um, uh, you know, uh, accident with the uh, professor Yeah, but I remember she broke her leg. She would probably run out to buy a bicycle. Yeah. 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 Perfect. It's just here. Sorry. Did the Napoleonic Road, the um, well, I think uh, the, the law of obligations of the, the Code Civil was largely uh, taken over, so that helped. Um, a really good contribution was his brother, because we have been a republic for a long time, and his brother was such a good king that he, uh, he laid the basis for a constitutional monarchy in the Netherlands. So I think that's Maybe that is even a more lasting uh, legacy of the, the Napoleons, of the Bonapartes and, uh, and the legislation. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much again. Well, I don't think we have much influence of uh, Anglo-Saxon law. In some forms of, uh, of contracts, I think we, uh, we take over uh, English uh, or American forms in, in, uh, in contracts of lease, for instance, there are some, uh, some minor influences, but it's, it's still not something very important, certainly not in private law. Okay, thank you.